Hi, I'm Robert Chen, and this is an introduction to vaccine safety. The presentation reflects only my viewpoint. Let's begin with some take-home messages. Immunizations have been a great success in the past, and they're definitely needed in the future. However, several traumatic vaccine safety challenges have occurred worldwide in recent years. This is due to a unique moment in the history of mankind and adaptations in a new paradigm using a life cycle approach is needed for continued future success of humanizations. And this requires involvement of all societal stakeholders. This slide shows several vaccine safety controversies the last couple of decades that have led the public to wonder whether vaccines are still safe. The controversies range from whether measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine causes autism, the long-term effects of polio vaccine being contaminated with simian virus 40, whether hepatitis B vaccine causes multiple sclerosis, what are the long-term side effects of thimerosal as a preservative, and the rotavirus vaccine, whether that causes interception. Now, there's a possible Shakespearean explanation for this sudden onslaught of concerns about vaccine safety, and it follows along the lines of all the world's a stage and all the men and women are merely players. So, for example, could it be due to media and tabloids eager for a scandal, lawyers eager for class action lawsuits, parents eager for an explanation for their child's illness, politicians eager to pander for easy votes, public health eager to vaccinate the world, researchers eager for fame, and vaccine companies eager for a profit. I posit that there's an alternative hypothesis to this. To set the context for this alternative hypothesis, let's explore why vaccine safety is important. A higher standard of safety is expected of vaccines for several reasons. Most of you are familiar with the first do no harm principle in medicine. Now the moral duty for first do no harm is generally greater in public health because the decision impacts on large population, not just one patient at a time in, as it is in clinical medicine. Next, vaccines are generally healthy unlike most recipients of drugs who are already ill. Finally, many vaccines are universally recommended or even mandated. This lower risk tolerance for vaccines translate into a need to search for rare reactions. With preventive vaccines, reactions are as rare as one per 100,000 doses or per million doses may be important in contrast, for most therapeutic drugs, reaction rates of 1 per 1,000 are routine, and for some cancer treatments, they may even be universal. Unfortunately for us, studies of rare events are more costly, difficult, and less likely to be definitive. This table looks at the disease incidence for several vaccine preventable diseases in the pre-vaccine era in a recent year, 2012, as well as similar data for total vaccine adverse events. The bottom part is familiar to all of you in terms of the great success of vaccines and immunization in reducing the disease incidence for almost all these diseases by close to 99 uh, percent, uh, with the exception of uh, pertussis, which in recent years has had a resurgence. In contrast, for vaccine adverse events, we've gone from zero in the pre-vaccine era to a recent year of about uh, 8,600 number of reports to the U.S. Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System um, for the specific 
vaccines listed on this slide um, and even more reports, uh, 26,000 plus uh, for all reports. For most of us working in the medical field, we tend to look at this data in the horizontal perspective, that is the great reduction in the target diseases compared to the pre-vaccine era of greater than 95%. But we tend to forget for the average non-medical person, they tend to see this data from the vertical perspective, that is they're relatively unlikely to see in a case of diphtheria, hepatitis, etc., but they're uh, very likely to experience some local reaction, fever, as well as other adverse events. So there is a built-in miscommunication between the medical and non-medical person in the vaccine safety domain reflected in these horizontal and vertical perspectives as shown here. This slide summarizes the previous data in a graph. It's an evolution of immunization's use and safety concerns, where on x-axis you have maturity of the immunization program, and on the y-axis you have incidence of three lines, disease, vaccine coverage, and adverse events. In the first phase, before you have a vaccine, for example, we don't have a vaccine against HIV at the moment, uh, all you have is a high rate of disease. But once you have a vaccine that is efficacious and introduced with increasing coverage, the target disease rate falls, but there's an increasing number of adverse events, both true reactions caused by the vaccine as well as coincidental adverse events. At very high coverages, the two lines approximate each other and if you had a media scare, you may have a loss of confidence resulting in dropping coverage and resurgence of disease and outbreak. And eventually, if you're able to resume confidence with high coverage, uh, the disease might continue to be uh, controlled. And rarely, you might even be able to eradicate the target disease as was done with smallpox. And at that time, what they did was they stopped vaccination and eradicated the adverse events. Unfortunately, in the current era of bioterrorism, you hate to create a vacuum of immunity that a bioterrorist would be able to take advantage of. And so whether one would be able to stop vaccination in the future, even if you eradicated the wild disease, remains an open question. That puts the immunization program manager in a mature program in a very uncomfortable situation of high vaccine coverage, relatively low disease, and fairly prominent adverse events waiting for that next loss of confidence. So an alternative way forward is in fact to better study these adverse events to see which ones are truly due to the vaccine and which ones are not and do us our and do our best to uh, prevent uh, future adverse events. So how do we establish causal link between adverse event and vaccine? First, if there's a unique laboratory result, for example, a child receives mumps vaccine and develops aseptic meningitis, we do a spinal tap and the virus isolated, we do genetic sequencing and show that it's the vaccine and not the wild type. Another way to do it is if there's a unique clinical syndrome in otherwise healthy young adults who receive the smallpox vaccine that developed myopericarditis, that is an example of this. Now, if you had neither laboratory or clinical syndromes uh, that are relatively unique, then you have to do a very large epidemiologic study or a large clinical trial to complete all four cells of a two-by-two two table of vaccinated yes-no and illness or syndrome yes-no. 
in an unbiased manner that allow you to then do a calculation of rate of illness in either vaccinated and unvaccinated to see if it's a higher rate in vaccinated individuals. We note here that the typical vaccine adverse event report is just information contained in cell A of such of a two by two table, those who have been vaccinated and those also developed an illness or syndrome, which is less than one quarter of the information needed to do your two by two calculation. And therefore, the typical spontaneous or passive surveillance reports are rel relatively limited in their information content for you to be able to say anything about their causality. What are some of the lessons from this two by two table? In the past, whenever you had a mass vaccination, obviously many vaccine adverse events are reported. Now, it's okay to generate a hypothesis and hypotheses need to be tested. The problem is that if they're done in a very visible manner, uh, in a, for example, uh, in the first swine flu vaccine and Guillain-Barre syndrome or the first generation rural virus vaccine and susception that results in a lot of publicity and may result in a vaccine safety scare. Fortuitously, record linkage studies um, are now available that allows more quiet approach to this. Some of the databases are the general practitioners research database and vaccine safety data link. Um, as well is in countries like Taiwan that have developed na national health insurance databases. And you'll hear about more of these options in future talks in this series. So this diagram shows how a optimal structure for immunization safety monitoring might occur. First, you would have a vaccine adverse event reporting system that would generate hypothesis of uh, questions related to whether a vaccine could cause an adverse event. Then you might have some hypothesis clarification steps looking at clinical syndromes and standardizing case definitions. Next, you might have a hypothesis testing step looking at whether the vaccine actually caused the adverse event using a structure like the vaccine safety data link. You would also have a group that deals with risk perceptions and communications where you would disseminate the results of your research. And then finally, you might also have a group that focus on vaccine technology and development looking to develop new safer vaccines. This slide takes a look at the life cycle of a vaccine safety concern in a different perspective. So initially, because most of these are rare events, you tend to have initial case report. And if you are able to do standardized assessment, you might be able to develop it into a case series. Depending on whether this is a biologically plausible adverse event and rolling out other alternative hypotheses, you may then move on to doing a control study with the results that require you to look at it from a risk-benefit uh, policy perspective at either the societal level or the individual level. If you're able to understand the uh, risk factors and pathophysiology, that might then result in either treatment, compensation for the individual, development of a safer vaccine, development of appropriate contraindications, and maybe even screening. This and the next few slides introduce the idea of the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Network, or CISA. The need arises from the fact that vaccine adverse events occur fairly rarely for each clinician. These are therefore medical outliers that are relatively difficult to advance the science on. Now, historically, for a uh, rare disease like a leukemia, we don't expect the average primary care physician to advance the science of this field. We 
take a look at this issue from a regional perspective and organize tertiary referral centers that could see enough cases uh, on a regional basis for clinical trials to be organized and for the science to be advanced. And the CISA concept builds on this similar idea that we could develop academic centers of excellence where we have vaccine safety clinicians with clinical subspecialty for referrals and laboratory research capabilities. Now the distribution of biologic response to immunizations in the population is probably a bell-shaped curve for both immunogenicity and reactogenicity. Some people under-respond, some people over-respond, and the vast majority of the population in, are in the middle. Now, for immunogenicity, this is fairly straightforward in that those who under-respond, our solution is to have multiple doses in the immunization series to get as many people up high as possible. The difficulty is that for those who are on the tail end of uh, reactogenicity, those who over-respond, historically we have not had many solutions uh, for this. And this is where we hope to now make some headway scientifically. So the task of these CISA centers is to conduct standardized assessment and management of persons with either known reactions or suspected new uh, vaccine adverse event syndromes. And questions like, should the next dose in a patient with a prior adverse event uh, be given? And this provides real-time consult for clinicians and then we could follow them up for compliance and see what the outcome of this advice might be and over time continue to improve it. So the goal then is to increase the scientific understanding of these outliers in terms of immunology, pathophysiology, genetic and other predisposing risk factors, and maximize the utility of systems like the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System as a disease registry. If we could organize these eventually on a regional distribution, perhaps even in every single country, and disseminate protocols and findings via web, we could then create new subspecialty of immunization safety, advancing our scientific understanding. Now, what are some lessons from the Gaussian curve? Let's say if you're unlucky to have an adverse event after vaccination, and you wonder whether you should receive the next dose. From the individual perspective, this is obviously a totally rational question in your own self-interest. But unfortunately, from the societal perspective, you may be unlucky to be labeled as an anti-vaccine person. Now, in the future, the CISA Center may allow us to convert what is inherently a win-lose situation to a win-win situation where we would treat the actual individual vaccinee rather than the average patient. And uh, obviously this um, uh, personalized medicine is really the next medical revolution. We would get away from destructive labeling to possible constructive collaboration. We would immunize more safely versus just immunizing more. And such CSAs may become a safe harbor for certain researchers or certain dissatisfied parents for us to understand their hypothesized concern uh, in an early stage. Uh, several other countries, in addition to the U.S., have started such special immunization consults, uh, Australia, Italy, uh, in, um, in Verona region, as well as uh, Switzerland by phone. So following in the footsteps of Darwin and Wallace, what are some lessons in the evolution of immunization so far? First, I think we need to have some humility. Past success in immunization is no guarantee of future success, especially over historical time. We need to be 
looking forward instead of looking backward. We are in a de novo situation in the whole history of Homo sapiens, where up until last hundred years or so, all the immunity had been derived from wild disease-induced immunity. But now, from now forward, we're hoping to derive our immunity from vaccines. Therefore, each new birth cohort going forward needs protection forever at infinitum. At a time when the experience against the wild disease is increasingly historical rather than personal uh, experience. You could imagine a science fiction novel where in 10 generations the child wonders why would they need to be humanized and the answer is well the ancients told us we must get humanized. So obviously evolutionary success requires adaptability and how do we create infrastructure to sustain high immunization coverage in this brave new world? So what might be some adaptations needed? Well, we need an immunization safety system that is credible, effective, and sustainable. You would have appropriate scientific infrastructure and governance that is transparent without real or perceived conflict of interest. You would have appropriate structure in terms of its location at the right level and the right stakeholders, and it would be independent from both pro and anti-vaccine forces. It would have appropriate resources for staffing, funding, and tools, and it would attract staff that would have passion and curiosity to solve immunization safety puzzles. So in the long term, we would not only control and eliminate vaccine preventable, we would also do the same for vaccine-induced diseases. Some progress has been made in creating such a system in some developed countries, and we're only beginning in low and middle income countries. And we welcome you to join us in this effort. Thank you.